Our, our final panel uh, is Power in the Pacific, Asserting Military Influence in the South China Sea and Beyond. And it's moderated by Medal of Honor recipient Paul Buka. Uh, while a company commander in Vietnam, Buka received, among other decorations, the Bronze Star with V, Oak Leaf Cuffster, Purple Heart, and Medal of Honor. He later, uh, in addition to his military experience, uh, was appointed civilian aide to Secretary of the Army and has served as the past president of the Congressional Medal of Honor Society and the United uh, States of America. Uh, please welcome Paul uh, Buddy Buca. And that's the important question. What is our objective in what you're planning to do? Definition of objective must be finite. You gotta be able to say I'm done, I'm coming home. Has to have a tool of measurement. And three, it has to have some suggestion of a course of action that would lead you to success. So I wanna start on this particular one. Ask Roy, in the South China Sea, which I'm not even sure I've been by it. Uh, um, you certainly were. <laughs> I don't know much about it. What is our objective? in the South China Sea in our, our relations with China. Thank you, Paul, and it's a real privilege to be here. Thanks to the World Affairs Council, Megan and Amanda and your colleagues, it's a treat. Um, so it's a delight to be on a panel with Paul, and we've had several fun exchanges leading up to today, and I especially appreciate his formulation of this question because it, it really points to the central problem in the South China Sea. I think we're gonna go well beyond the South China Sea uh, to, to US-China relations more generally, but starting uh, with the South China Sea, uh, we don't know what our objective is, except that we want to be able to still be there in an unimpeded way. And so we have substi substituted our strategy for a process. And our process consists of three important parts. It says first, we want the international rule of law to be followed. Second, we want settlements to, this, to the disputes, the claimants that, that, the six claimants that have disputes in the South China, we want their settlement, the settlement of their disputes to be peaceable. And we don't take a position on what the settlement should be, but we want it, the process to be peaceable. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, we want freedom of navigation to be unimpeded, both military and civilian. Now, those, those process principles violate the three points that, that Paul just made, and they highlight uh, a, an important element that has been of frustration to American policymakers, which is, uh, in the aftermath of the, uh, an important speech that Secretary Clinton gave in 2010 at the, at the Hanoi ASEAN Regional Forum event, she articulated these points, and she said it's in the national interest of the United States that these principles be adhered to. And the Chinese were embarrassed at that event. Their, their foreign minister, who had previously been ambassador to the US and a person I've met, uh, was furious and left the room in a huff. Uh, all eight speakers had agreed with Secretary Clinton's speech. He, feel like, he felt like the group had piled on. He came back and gave a 45-minute diatribe uh, uh, articulating the Chinese perspective of things. They went home, the delegation went home, the military and strategic planners went about devising an approach that would not cross any of those or run counter to any of those principles and we've ended up with the island building and reclamation campaign that began to, uh, in, in, in a serious way in 2014, 20, 2013, 2014. Uh, in total, the Chinese have built up seven, seven low tide elevations into usable island-like entities, seven. Uh, you would think it was 130 of the 180 uh, above uh, low tide elevation rocks and, and reefs that are in the South China Sea. Uh, the reason it has uh, really resulted in so much outrage is one, we are largely, the US is largely ineffective in changing that pattern of behavior. Uh, as, our, as our commander of US Pacific Command said at the time, we're not gonna go to war over a pile of rocks. And the Chinese said, okay, 
The Americans have a process approach, not a strategy. They don't know what their objective is, but they've ruled, all, ruled out the use of force. And so the Chinese developed this gray zone approach in which they could enhance their capabilities, and we can debate whether those are usable in a time of conflict, but those low tide elevation former entities, which are now islands, serve to perpetuate the Chinese image throughout the South China Sea that, that the United States is in decline, and to the regional partners that China is on the rise. And so that's maybe not as pithy a, a response, but that, I think that's it largely, Paul. It fits perfectly with what George Casey told us. That's basically our reaction in many things. That people test us to see if, in fact, we will use force. And if we demonstrate that we will not, they go ahead with what they were going to do. So it just confirms. Anybody have any questions at this point? Yes, sir. Um, I, well, um, what's our stance with, stance with Vietnam, um, mainly Vietnam, actually? Well, it's, it's an interesting question. We have a, a long and torturous history with Vietnam. On this question, uh, the, Viet, the Vietnamese, a, a country of 80 plus million, are the single country in Southeast Asia that's willing to stand up to China. They have their own disputes, their own uh, cross claims, you might say, with what China claims in the South China Sea. And we have uh, a somewhat ambivalent defense relationship. We're willing to do more. We are now considering the, the sale of, uh, of uh, lethal weapons to, to Vietnam. Uh, but the Vietnamese have their own reasons for, for avoiding uh, uh, what you might call a strategic partnership with us, given their own geography and, and their own history with us. And so um, we have an improving relationship, but not one that is even anything close to being an alliance. Any other questions? Yes. Just stand up. How should the United States view um, President Xi's uh, One Belt, One Road initiative and infrastructure investments in countries outside of China? Thank you. It's a, it's a great question. Um, this is a national policy announced in late 2013, early 2014, essentially a uh, several trillion dollar effort to expand infrastructure projects heading west from China and, and ultimately connecting to the major capitals of Europe. Um, some argue it's in direct response to the Obama administration's pivot to Asia, so the, the Chinese have pivoted to their own west. Uh, there are lots of opportunities for business and investment, uh, but I'd also urge us to think that uh, in this era in which President Xi Jinping wants to turn China into a global power, He's argued that the Chinese people need to rejuvenate themselves and become a power uh, akin to what China enjoyed throughout, throughout its imperial history, that this is a, a plan that is not without its strategic components, that uh, growing uh, influence in the entire expanse between China and Europe in a way that uh, China is very involved in setting the, norm, uh, the evolving rules that would govern such entity. That, that it's, while it's an effort to expand, excuse me, export China's excess industrial and investment capacity, uh, with that will come geopolitical strings that will accrue to China greater benefit. Um, earlier, General Casey talked about his view of, of how China fits in the pantheon of challenges to the United States. And I was really uh, encouraged to hear his analysis, um, not least because I had the pleasure of, of working him for him for a year and a half when he was the director of strategy for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And we would talk, I mean, he was consumed with everything Iraq and Afghanistan in those days. And so in the infrequent times we could talk about China, he, he, was, he realized that the, the challenge was long-term, it was evolving, and it was comprehensive. Uh, we don't face an imminent conflict with China. The Chinese recognize that that would end very badly for them. 
And in any case, it's bad for business to fight wars with your major trading partner. Um, what we do face is a challenge for the future. And the Chinese perceive that the American era is coming to a close. Uh, they find lots of evidence for that, right? The Great Recession, the Chinese uh, believe that's a, a failure of our, of our system and our way of governance. And so they're looking to a future in which they will be um, one of the two or three major global powers. For sure, they want to be the major power in the Asia-Pacific region. And they think that they have to have a military that's commensurate with this comprehensive national power that they're building elsewise, especially in the economic domain. And so the challenge for us is not to diminish the military threat so we feel better about ourselves, but to recognize the comprehensive nature of the challenge and prepare for a generations-long uh, competition with, with China. And it doesn't have to, that conflict or that competition does not have to result in conflict, but we have to prepare for it and we have to engage in it. And the engaging doesn't mean we just seek to put down the Chinese advances, uh, or find the flaws in their political system, of which there are many, and their own domestic challenges, which are enormous. Our challenge is to really rise to the occasion, be the best that we can be as a nation in all of the ways in which we present ourselves on the global stage. Yes, sir. I think the Chinese goal has been um, iterative. And by that I mean uh, they set out intending to convey a message to regional states that um, theirs was a position that had to be taken into account. They expected more pushback from us. Uh, in my think tank role, I have the great opportunity to work with our most recent US Chief of Naval Op operations, Admiral John Greenert. And Admiral Greenert engaged regularly with his Chinese counterpart during this period. And Admiral Wu Li of the Chinese side said to him on more than one occasion, we expected you to do something more, and you didn't, so we kept going. Uh, now, is it their goal to impede peacetime freedom of navigation, civilian commercial? Absolutely not. 50% uh, of China's total daily fossil fuel requirements travel through the South China Sea every day. 80% um, of, their, of their, their total imported. About $5 trillion worth of commerce traverses the South China Sea on an annual basis. And there's actually a formula to figure that out, and, and my team and I have done that. And about a third of that is to China. The last thing they want to do is uh, create sea lines that are impeded because they would have dramatic impacts on the Chinese economy. What they do want to do is to convey that they are a player. Now, you, you may say, well, that's, that's pretty, a pretty esoteric sort of goal. I mean, aren't there other ways to do that? And there certainly are. This is just one that they're employing in the security domain. From a military perspective, uh, those islands, or, uh, if we can call them that, present some challenge in, during a period of conflict, no challenge, absolutely no challenge, during peacetime. Uh, you may recall last July, the International Tribunal uh, in, the, in The Hague judged that uh, the Chinese claims were largely without merit. And they said, first, you, uh, we, you take a land-based approach to figuring out how much of the sea is actually yours that can be called a territorial sea, a 12 nautical mile territorial sea, or a 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone. They invalidated the Chinese claim that that long cow tongue nine dash line was all China. No, they said. It's based on the islands or the reefs or the other elevations. Um, and none of them generate an exclusive economic zone. So it's a series of 12 nautical mile ones. Um, and so, 
we have tested the Chinese excessive claims. Um, during the end of the Obama administration, we ended up uh, conducting highly publicized and politicized freedom navigation operations. Um, we accused the Chinese of militarizing the South China Sea as we were conducting these long-standing freedom of navigation operations. We were foolish, in my view, to talk about it publicly. We have been doing these for decades, and we played into the Chinese hands. Uh, the Trump administration took several months to reevaluate. They have rebut, excuse me, um, uh, begun anew these freedom of navigation operations, conducted four uh, since May, and uh, they generally do so with much less publicity and uh, frankly, the Chinese criticism has lessened as a result. Um, so, as, as the, one of the best experts on this region that I can think of says, Rear Admiral Mike McDevitt of the Center for Naval Analyses, this is not a problem that is solvable, it is only manageable. We are not going to get to a point where we can impose a solution, probably good given some of the discussion we had <coughs> earlier in the day, and frankly, the Chinese would resist such an approach in any case. The best we can do is keep it from turning into a, a much bigger situation. We have much larger issues with the Chinese. We're gonna talk about North Korea in a minute, I think Paul said he would mention. That is way above South China Sea in terms of its consequence for the US. Game. So, critically important. Um, we don't have an alliance with Taiwan because we say Taiwan isn't a state, uh, and yet we have military plans to assist in the defense of Taiwan if China would ever begin, begin combat operations against Taiwan. It's critically important for United States interests that we maintain faith with the people of Taiwan and that we help them resist the coercive efforts of the mainland Chinese. Very different situation from the rest of the South China Sea. Right here, sir. Would you say that China has given up on a military option of war with the United States in lieu of an economic war, and that they will eventually become the primary international monetary unit? Uh, I'm not sure that they ever had a plan to, to have a, a, a great power war with the United States. Um, what they want to do is have sufficient military power such that it's a complement to their overall comprehensive national power. They definitely see the period in which free markets and American-style uh, investment and business uh, are on decline and state-managed, state-planned uh, economic activity is on the rise. They believe that. And they have really exceptional plans to try and carry that out. Um, there are flaws with such a system. There are many flaws. And, and over time, our perception has been that those flaws will, will become more evident and the challenges for the Chinese will become greater. But they're on a pretty good run. And, uh, and so we have to, to, to rephrase what I said earlier, gird us ourselves up for a generational long challenge. One of the things I do at my think tank is I'm the chief of staff to a commission, the, the, the Commission on the Theft of American Intellectual Property. It's co-chaired by Governor John Huntsman, just announced as U.S. Ambassador to Russia, and Admiral Dennis Blair, formerly Commander of Pacific Command and then President Obama's first Director of National Intelligence. And the principal finding of that effort is the Chinese are the worst um, perpetrator of IP theft anywhere in the world. No matter how you measure it, between two-thirds and 80% of the problem is Chinese in origin. And the Chinese would say, um, well, we have national objectives to become, to create national champions so that we can be globally, global leaders in a whole range of fields. And this is the quickest way to accomplish it. So we have to realize that's the nature of that challenge. That's the nature of that competition and we have to prepare ourselves. We have to, one of the things that the commission said is, we have really inadequate policy, and the president doesn't use the tools that he has. And so we, we've, 
really worked very hard to with the with the both the Obama and Trump administrations to try to bring that about. Now I'm going to exercise my prerogative on. We're going to ask the question on on um, North Korea. So it started out. I was asked to come speak to the Rotary Club of Seoul, and I said I really don't want to fly all the way to Seoul to talk to the Rotary. <laughs> and I got a call from the American ambassador that said that Rotary Club is constituted with the 20 largest corporations in Korea. The CEO and chairman of each one sits there with an inter interpreter and a bodyguard. So we would like you to speak to them. So I said, OK. And I flew over to Seoul, and I was chairman of Wheeling Pit, so I thought I'd bring up steel, which I did. And then I told them I'm going to the DMZ. And I was really curious what it was like, because uh, there's 120 American Army Rangers that go to sleep each night surrounded by 100,000 bad guys. And they had asked me to visit. In the room, they started raising their hands saying, can we go with you? I said, how many of you been to the DMZ? None. I asked, how many of your bodyguards had been there? None. And I thought, found it fascinating that none of them were even curious, unless they went with me, me to this thing. Maybe they were bitten by. As I was driving in the van, I had really fancy vans because they all came along, as you went by a building and you looked in the rear, you noticed a tank barrel pointing north. And when we got there, I couldn't believe we were there. It's half the distance to Waterbury, from Seoul to the DMZ, half the distance to Waterbury, with no traffic jams. <laughs> That's how quickly this war could start. And my question, Roy, is the same one. What is our objective in dealing with North Korea, given the rhetoric that flows around the clock on our media about the imminence of war? I think on North Korea, our objective is very clear and has, and has been consistent since the uh, mid-1990s, and that is the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, as General Casey noted earlier, uh, we may be in the phase in which that denuclearization occurs after they already have a nuclear capability. For the first decade and a half, our, it was our intent to pre prevent the North Koreans from getting the bomb. They likely have it now. So the question is, do we have an objective that is achievable by all of the means available uh, to the U.S. government? We, there's three prongs to the, to the strategy. One is uh, diplomatic, and National Security Advisor and Secretary of Defense have said diplomacy is in the lead. Um, it's very quiet. We don't hear a lot about it, but that's what they've said. The second is economic. Uh, we have in place an ever-tightening um, body of sanctions against both North Korean entities and now the Chinese businesses and banks that enable that activity. But there's still more that can be done there. And the third is uh, the, the military or hard security approach. Uh, for most of the last two decades, the military option was off the table. And, uh, and presidents would even be the, perp the people who said it's not an option. Uh, we now have a leadership team that says it is an option. And part of the concern there is, it's hard for anyone to imagine how you employ a military option against North Korea that won't result in the immediate and unimpeded rocket and, and artillery shelling of Seoul from the North Korean uh, cannons and, and missile launchers that sit in cave revetments just on the other side of the DMZ. Um, I'm friends with a retired uh, Korean lieutenant general, he said, I need to know the statistics. What are the studies that have been done about the impact of cannon artillery in urban settings? Because our people are not taking it seriously, and we need to do so. Uh, it would be a, a terrible catastrophe if we precipitated a crisis that resulted in uh, 
tens if not hundreds of thousands of casualties as a result of a North Korean retaliation. But if you take it off the table entirely, uh, then you really incentivize the North Koreans to uh, proceed with all haste in developing their nuclear capability. Thank you. Now, I didn't get any before over here. Yes, sir. Right. <laughs> I understand that we do. Uh, most recently, I don't know if everyone saw this, Secretary Mattis said, though, we're disinclined to shoot at a North Korean missile launch. And I wondered why that was. Um, it could have been because the North Koreans would then judge that that was an act of war and they could then retaliate in whatever fashion they saw fit. And it could also be because we very quickly judged the parameters of the launch to determine it was not a threat to US territory or to that of our allies. Um, it, that, that, that's a very technological solution. We could, that, that is possible that, that, that we reach that judgment that quickly. Uh, my concern is though that you get one shot to get it right. And if we get it wrong, uh, we, have, we have really put ourselves in a, in a bad situation. So uh, we are reaping the whirlwind of two decades of inadequate response to the North Korean efforts. And I'm not sure that any immediate action can redress all of that. Excellent. Questions, yes. Actually, our situation, by virtue of our um, heretofore open, relatively open immigration policies, is much better than either of the other two. Uh, the Japanese situation is the worst at the moment. Uh, they're going to see a 30% decline in population in the next three decades. They know it's coming. It's a slow-moving uh, slow tornado, you might say. And they simply can't make the policy changes to allow for um, a reversal or at least a stemming the tide of that, that demographic um, challenge that they face. In China, uh, it's, it's complicated as many things are. By the way, China's workforce started declining four years ago, um, or, f or four and a half years ago. Uh, it, it's not a matter of them it happening at some point, it's already started to happen. And when you have that unusual family structure in which you have one kid with two parents and four grandparents, um, you, you realize how important it is to have that kid be productive and contribute to the social welfare net for um, his parents and grandparents. And so their system is getting ready to crash. And the middle of next decade will be really the, a major test point for them. Uh, but it goes beyond that. Uh, because the imbalance of male to female results in um, many Chinese men, young men, being unable to marry because there's simply no candidates. And so you have criminal activity that is rampant to try and find brides for these otherwise unmarriageable males. Uh, there are those who, who think in terms of catastrophic futures in which China might actually precipitate conflict to kill off some of these <laughs> unmarriageable males because they can't think of a policy solution. I, I think that's pretty extreme and I don't really see any evidence <laughs> to it, but it points to the gravity of the problem that such uh, extraordinary methods might be uh, conceived of. Um, so the implications are many. Uh, one of them is a friend of mine and an advisor to us at MBR is named Nick Eberstadt. And he's a scholar 
at the American Enterprise Institute. He's written on strategic demography. One of the things he said is, we ought to think about our alliance partners in terms of their demographic outlooks. And, and he's sending a message to Japan and to South Korea to some extent when he, when he makes such points. When we think about the future, it's, it, you, you can do things now or not do things now that make you a more or, or lesser quality potential ally. And so the demography is a huge dimension of it. I only touched on just a few, a few of the, the relevant points. I hate to imagine an army of a lot of really angry women. So, uh, <laughs> next question. Thank you. It's, a, it's a, uh, two questions quickly. One is, if we look at Asia, the influence uh, over the countries that traditionally were our partners with the United States, we are losing them to China's influence. If you look at what's happening in Philippines to some degree, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, and some of the other countries, they're becoming more aligned towards China um, and that's actually a slow, gradual process that we are seeing, and it's, it's unfortunately unfolding pretty clearly. The other part is that China has no incentive to, uh, to stop North Korea, and, and what can be done if, if China was to be a real partner in that effort? So I, at your first point, I think, is very well taken. Uh, the Chinese have a, have a real... Um, bounty of options available to entice neighbors or regional partners to uh, not turn their back on the U.S., but become somewhat less reliable. Um, Pakistan is a great example. We talked earlier about the Belt and Road. There's a, there's a specific China-Pakistan economic corridor, $43 billion in investment. Every quarter or so, I brief uh, 15 or 20 Afghani and Pakistani generals who come to the U.S. National Defense University. And they are over the moon thinking about the, the benefits of this $43 billion, it's not a whole lot, $43 billion China-Pakistan economic corridor. Um, I'm not a South Asia specialist, but I would argue that many Americans have, have had challenges thinking about the the strength of our partnership with Pakistan over the years anyway. So it's not a complete flip, and the two have long had, China and Pakistan have long had a strategic partnership. Your, your basic point, I think, is um, really a one that should lead to introspection for us as a, as a country and as citizens of this country, which is what is changing, why is it changing to our, to our detriment, and what are the national self-strengthening things that we need to do in order to redress that? Um, so that's more of a, a, a general set of answers. With regard to North Korea, um, I would submit to you that the Chinese goals are not the same as ours. They say we are for denuclearization. In that respect, we have, we have latched onto that and said we share goals with the Chinese. Well. Uh, what's very important to them is that the peninsula not be unified under South Korean control because they have very real questions about whether U.S. forces would align themselves very close to the Chinese border. And much as in the South China Sea or the East China Sea, the Chinese still, the national security planners within China still have very 19th century views about the value that geography and space conveys in adding to your national security. And so they simply can't think about a future in, with the, in which U.S. forces are, are just across uh, the, the Yalu River in what was formerly North Korea. They have no great affection for Kim Jong-un or the DPRK. They care a lot that that ground, that that territory not be occupied by the South. And so um, understanding their incentives I think is very important. You've seen most recently that Chinese leaders have said, um, and this has really trickled out over the course of the last several weeks, that they're restricting the banking of Chinese banks doing the business of North Korean entities, and they are cutting off support for Chinese companies doing business with their North Korean counterparts. But North Korean trading companies are so embedded within the broader Chinese economy that th that is going to be a very difficult process to unwind. Um, I'm 
currently beginning an initiative in which we talk with Chinese counterparts, so in a track 1.5 kind of setting, where we think about the military implications of a regime that collapses. And in particular, how to think about securing the strategic sites within North Korea in a circumstance in which um, regime control is, is under question. Uh, the nightmare scenario is that Kim Jong-un goes away, there is no control, and you have the special forces of the US, China, and South Korea all running around in the dark in an uncoordinated way trying to secure those North Korean security uh, strategic sites. And so there's a lot to be done there as well. Next question, right here. Stand up. There you go. question was, what are the, realistically, what are the odds of China brokering, um, brokering a deal between the United States and North Korea? Correct? Yes. Thank you. I'll be a little flippant. They did once. It was called the six-party process. And that conveyed entirely to China's advantage and very little to U.S. advantage. We frankly agreed to that process because of the wars that we were involved in in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, Chinese are brilliant at managing that sort of process. It played to their strengths, not to ours. They got to prolong the period of time in which North Korea could grow their programs, both missile and nuclear. Uh, and so um, if you can't tell, I'm not a fan of the six-party process. And it's hard to imagine a, a circumstance in which China would be the leader in any other sort of activity other than that. I'll, I'll tell a quick story. Um, I happened to be in Beijing in November 2010, just after the North Koreans had shelled the South Korean island of Waipido. And uh, two interesting things happened. One, we had a meeting with the uh, general on the Central Military Commission who was responsible for managing North Korean relations. He's the chair of the general political department. And their, their ties between the two militaries are political, not operational. And so we went into the meeting. We had found out about the, the, the artillery shelling just a couple hours before. We went into the meeting, and the admiral I was with said, General, thanks for seeing us. Uh, it's a very busy day. You obviously are thinking a lot about North Korea. You know, it's good of you to have made the time to, to, see, to see us today. And the Chinese general said, what are you talking about? And we said, you know, the, the artillery shelling of Waipido that took place a couple hours ago, you know, we appreciate you see us in the midst of all that. He goes, there was no such attack. Meanwhile, all the majors in the background, their Blackberries or, or iPhones, and they ran out, turned on CNN, came back in, handed the general a card, and he said, I can now confirm uh, <laughs> that such an attack took place. So that was uh, a way in a way, buffoonish, right? That the guy responsible for managing that relation didn't even know. But that says something to the, the lack of closeness between the two. The next day, we met with the vice foreign minister, who happens to be now the Chinese ambassador to the US. And he said, this is a direct quote, now that they have gotten this out of their system, shouldn't we go back to the six party process? And I thought, there's a dozen or more rock soldiers that are dead, I don't call that getting it out of their system. But in any case, the six-party process is about managing the North Korean nuclear problem, not the whole gamut of security issues within Northeast Asia. And so um, that's a long way of saying I'm very skeptical that Chinese would be helpful in brokering a deal. Next question. was what should we do to stabilize the region given the environmental issues that are at play? And, and the resulting refugee crisis. And I think you're speaking especially about Myanmar and Bangladesh. The sources of it are essentially ethnic and religious. Um, a disproportionate burden is borne by Thailand, a lesser extent by China, and really not much by anybody else. And um, and we have uh, a large and growing crisis. 
Um, this is going to sound like a punt, and unfortunately, it's not an area of great expertise for me. Uh, what we're not going to see is regional leadership. The Chinese have no incentive to get involved in this process in a significant way. And so the net result means it has to be internationalized. Um, and the, one of the challenges that uh, Da Aung San Suu Kyi is this revered international figure, and she appears to be complicit in at least some dimensions of the crisis. And the UN um, is, I would say, reluctant to challenge her to a great extent. Secretary General made a statement. It was, I mean, you could interpret it a lot of different ways, but ultimately I, it strikes me that this is a process in which the UN needs to think about the, the issue in its contemporary context and in essence, forget some of the historical legacies that she might have stood for and do what's right by those uh, disadvantaged peoples. Thank you very much. Uh, at this time, uh, uh, the Charter Oak chapter of the Military Officers Association would like to uh, express its uh, uh, appreciation uh, for the great work our partner, the World Affairs uh, Council, has done in putting this together. Uh, and I was wondering if uh, Amanda and Megan can come forward. Uh, and I'd like to present them with the medallion uh, of the, the Chief of Army